Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the effects of sympathetic stimulation on the heart. Okay, so so far we've seen that when we stimulate the heart with noradrenaline, it will activate beta-1 receptors, which will lead to the activation of this alpha-SGTP subunit, which will then activate the adenylalcyclase 5 or 6 enzymes, which will convert ATP into cyclic AMP. So what we now want to see is what is the effect of cyclic AMP? Well, basically, it's going to activate protein kinase A. But protein kinase A is a more complicated topic than you would think, because there are two types of protein kinase A. Okay, so when we talk about protein kinase A, there is type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A. And in fact, in the cardiac muscle cells activated by uh, beta-1 receptor, uh, sorry, by noradrenaline, uh, we're going to get activation of both of these types, and they're going to do slightly different things. So, let me discuss the two different types of protein kinase A briefly with you then. So there is type 1 protein kinase A, and by the way, I'll abbreviate protein kinase A from now on to just PKA. Okay, so this is type 1, PKA, and there is also type 2 PKA, and by the way, uh, pompous scientific articles will refer to protein kinase A as the cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase rather than the protein kinase A. Often you will hear that terminology used if you're actually reading a, um, if you're actually reading a research article, cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase. Okay, but protein kinase A we'll use from now on. Right, and we'll just abbreviate that to PKA. Right, okay, so you have these two types, type 1 and type 2 PKA. And what is the difference between these two? Well, basically, type 1 PKA is free within the cytoplasm of the cell, whereas type 2 PKA is anchored to the membrane by uh, proteins known as A kinase anchoring proteins, which we'll talk about later. Okay, so um, let's um, begin uh, with the structure of both of these, and then what we'll do is we'll discuss how these ones are soluble and these ones are attached to the membrane, and we'll look at the different targets of the ones which are attached to the membrane and the ones which are soluble, basically. So. They both have a sort of common structure amongst them, okay? Now, protein kinase A exists in a complex known as the R2C2 complex, and both pro type 1 and type 2 protein uh, kinase A exist like this, when they're in the inactive state anyway. So the R2C2 complex I will draw as a cartoon like this, okay? Right. So, what you have is you have two regulatory domains. One, two. So, these are both regulatory domains. Regulatory domains, okay? And they are dimerized together. So, you have two regulatory domains. That is the origin of this R2 here. So, these are regulatory domains, okay? And this is getting a little bit difficult to draw. So this is a regulatory domain, and here is another regulatory domain, outlined in blue here. Okay, and each of these regulatory domains, it has these two binding sites for cyclic AMP. So this is one regulatory domain here, and this is two regulatory, this is the second regulatory domain. So they're dimerized together here, okay, and each one has two cyclic AMP binding sites. So these little holes, these are for cyclic AMP to bind. Now, these regulatory domains, they also hold on to two catalytic domains. So these here, these are catalytic domains. Catalytic domains. So these are the portions which actually perform the enzymic action. These are the portions which actually add phosphate groups onto proteins. So we will uh, colour them in or outline them in purple. So these are the catalytic domains. 
domains or the catalytic subunits. In fact, not catalytic domains. These are actually catalytic subunits. They're separate proteins. So this should be a catalytic subunit, and this should be a regulatory subunit rather than a, uh, a regulatory domain. So there are four separate proteins here, all involved in this R2C2 complex. And this is why it's called the R2C2 complex, because you've got two regulatory subunits and two catalytic subunits, all forming this tetrama, basically. Now, this is the same for both type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A. And in type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A, the catalytic subunits that are in these R2C2 complexes are exactly the same. So, the catalytic subunit does not vary between type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A. So, the actual activity of these catalytic subunits, i.e. Um, their ability to put um, phosphate groups onto proteins, it does not vary between the type 1 pKa and the type 2 pKa. What varies instead is what regulatory subunits you use. So if you are type 2 protein kinase A, you use the R2, the second regulatory subunit, and if you are type 1 protein kinase A, you use the R1 regulatory subunit. So, in type 1 protein kinase A, you form R2C2 complexes where both of the regulatory subunits are R1 subunits, and then you have these two catalytic subunits bound. Now, the R1 subunit does not bind to uh, proteins that are associated with the plasma membrane, and this means that the type 1 protein kinase A R2C2 complexes are free within the cytoplasm of the cell. Whereas, the type 2 protein kinase A, you use R2 subunits as your regulatory subunits, and you then use the same catalytic subunits as in protein, type 1 protein kinase A. And these R2 subunits, they do bind to proteins that are associated with the plasma membrane, so these ones end up docked, basically, at the plasma membrane. Right, so that's the difference between the two. Okay, right, but the point is that these catalytic subunits, which are the portions which actually perform the enzymic reaction, those are the same amongst the two. Right, so, what then happens when cyclic AMP comes? When cyclic AMP comes up to type 1 or type 2 protein kinase A, what's going to happen is that if we represent cyclic AMP as a little orange ball here, so this is the cyclic AMP as a little orange ball. So this represents the cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Okay, and you'll need four of these, one to sit in each binding site. What will happen is when the cyclic AMP comes and binds in these binding sites of the regulatory subunits, it changes the conformation of these regulatory subunits. Okay. So let's now draw the other one. So here are these two cyclic AMP binding sites, and you've now got two cyclic AMP molecules bound, one in each of those cyclic AMP binding sites. So, if I draw in blue the regulatory subunit of protein kinase A, whether it be a type 1 or type 2 regulatory subunit, this, the change is pretty much the same or at least the, the outcome of the change is the same, whether the actual conformational change is the same. I don't know, but the outcome is certainly the same. So we'll show it the same in the, as far as this cartoon is concerned. So now I've got these four cyclic AMP molecules bound in these cyclic AMP binding sites here. And what that is going to cause is it's going to cause the release of these catalytic subunits from the regulatory subunits. So off come the catalytic subunits here in bright purple. Okay, so when cyclic AMP binds to the cyclic AMP binding sites on the regulatory subunits, the regulatory subunits change conformation and release the catalytic subunits. And this is something I should have stressed ages ago when I first introduced this st structure. The catalytic subunits are inactive when they are bound to the regulatory subunits. So in this R2C2 complex, the catalytic subunits are doing nothing. They are not phosphorylating any sort of protein. Once they have been released, however, these two catalytic subunits 
are going to be active and these are now going to go off and add phosphate groups onto proteins and lead to the downstream pathways of protein kinase A. Now, the main difference then between the type 1 and the type 2 protein kinase A is that the type 1 protein kinase A is just free within the cytoplasm because the R1 regulatory subunit doesn't bind to these proteins at the plasma membrane. Whereas the type 2 protein kinase A, they are bound to proteins which themselves are bound to the plasma membrane. So they are associated with the plasma membrane. It means that type 2 protein kinase A can be very, very specialized. It can be positioned perfectly so that when it is activated, the catalytic subunits are going to be released on proteins that are also bound to this protein that the type 2 protein kinase A is bound to. Okay, and we'll uh, discuss this more. We'll give specific examples of this and we'll talk about these proteins which type 2 protein kinase A is bound to in the next video. But the point is that when we stimulate a cardiomyocyte uh, with noradrenaline, both of these types of protein kinase A are going to get activated and both are going to have downstream effects. But their targets are quite different, basically. So, uh, and it's because these ones are targeted, they are basically positioned next to the proteins that they are going to phosphorylate, whereas these ones aren't. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.